Cool. So I guess we can do some intros um, and kind of kick this off. Um, so hello, I'm Andre from Devon Mind. Um, I'm marketing and fundraising officer. So any of our social media and stuff, that's all me at the moment. So uh, we've, we've interacted without you even knowing. Um, hope you're all doing well tonight, staying safe, uh, enjoying the sunshine, as Paul said. Um, we're going to be talking about a lot of things tonight. We'll probably keep it to about 45, 50 minutes, depending on questions. Um, and yeah, we're just going to kind of kick straight off into it. Do you want to do an intro, Paul, for those of, you, those of us who don't know you? Yeah, firstly, Andre, I just want to say thank you for having me on. Um, we've been networking the last maybe four weeks. And first, I just want to say, mate, what you're doing and what mine are doing is incredible. Um, not just with the pandemic, but as a whole, it's much needed. Um, so really good to see you come on my sort of radar in the last sort of few weeks, because I didn't actually know you must be quite new in the Devon area. Um, yeah, so Plymouth Mine's been around for a long time. Um, we yeah. used to be known as Plymouth and District Mine. Um, there was an Exeter mine that shut down a couple of years ago, unfortunately. So we kind of took on the rest of Devon. Um, but yeah, during the pandemic, we just started to really grow. Um, and I'm the first kind of marketing and fundraising person to come on. So yeah, it's a big time for us. Um, and this is the first of many things that we want to do with people like yourself. So yeah. Okay, mate. So yeah, thank you for, for what you do. Um, my name is Paul Thompson. I'm a, a mental health advocate. Uh, predominantly, I target men that are suffering in silence with their mental health. Uh, and the reason why I do that and the reason why I campaign and have passion to, to really give back is because I'm a sufferer myself. Uh, I suffered and still suffer with mental health from an early age with sort of um, the way I was brought up in my family to bullying, to neglect, isolation and so on. So going into care at the age of 13, having that progression in life with a new lease of life in a new family because of what happened previously in my in my childhood I was never really dealt with in regards to mental health so everything was pretty much fast tracked in my 20s getting a job relationship so I suffered for many years and I had a breakdown at the age of 32 uh, because of bottling it all in because of the stigma because of uh, the lack of awareness which I couldn't really see at the time made me sort of go for um you know just really just have a, a moment where i just didn't want to be here anymore andre uh, uh, i had a breakdown i tried to take my life uh, four or five times within a week and i was uh, lucky enough to be in a position to have therapy to have a diagnosis of what was going on with the triggers with the trauma with what was going on in my environment at the time uh, and a lot of it was just really brushed under the carpet because of the stigma because i didn't feel i could talk because of the the lack of awareness at the time, if it was my employer, if it was with uh, my relationship. So having that from all angles was really the the bottling up process where it was just got too much. Um, luckily, I'm in a really good place now. Um, I had the, the sort of self-care, the diagnosis, the the therapy and all, all the counselling that I needed to really um, understand what was going on with myself. And it was only, what, two years ago I set up Males Allowed which is a, a men's support service for, for men, uh, predominantly you know, suffering in silence, so they can reach out if it's via a group meet, playing football, a quiz night, any kind of environment that will make it comfortable for, for men to really reach out, to try and accommodate different areas. So even walk and talks in scenic environments, even, like I say, doing quiz nights and things like that, to really make that message um, quite, you know, an easier option. So the environment being key, accommodating um, men really in different areas and you know we, we helped a lot of men we really did um, and like I said it was it was needed at the time it's still needed now even more because obviously the pandemic we're in everybody's experiencing new emotions obviously with isolation with uh, obviously lockdown having new you know these new thoughts and sort of having to adapt more than anything Andre to to really but people may be experiencing mental health for the first time without realizing it because being in this new environment so yeah I, I set up Mail Slide and obviously gone on to um, carry on doing the campaign and, and obviously with the, the pandemic now um, we've all been restricted in what we can and can't do so doing a lot of sort of advocating online with videos with posts and so on and once this is over really the key for me now personally is to go into schools to, to really go into schools colleges employers to really give that awareness of mental health how we can cope how we can sort of have that conversation without no fear and judgment 
because I believe, um, like you, Andre, um, you know, mental health starts at an early age and we need to have that prevention. We need to have that education and awareness. Yeah, so if anyone hasn't read uh, Paul's story, um, if you go onto his profile at some point after this, um, he's got a brilliant blog post that he's written, um, which kind of goes into a bit of the background of what he's been through and stuff. He's just touched on it there. Um, it's a fascinating story, Paul. Um, very moving indeed. Um, yeah, in the interest of being completely open and breaking down that stigma, um, I'll quickly go through my journey as well. Um, so I am I'm now 30 years old. I used to work, at, so I went to uni in Southampton and then worked in London and felt the pressure of kind of that busy life. I grew up in Devon and then kind of moved into this busy environment and it just was too much for my brain. Um, had a lot of problems with uh, anger actually, which is not recognized necessarily as a mental health condition, but obviously contributes to a lot of, you know, what people go through. Um, yeah, and long story short, I've suffered depression since uh, 2015. So almost six years now. Um, yeah, and just basically been a, a slow process. I've been quite lucky in that the things I've tried have worked. Um, but I was in a, a pretty bad place, just like yourself, um, a long time ago. And yeah, thankfully, just got great people around me and great support that, you know, have moved, moved forward. So yeah, you'll find a lot of a lot of people in my position who work at charities and mental health charities, we do have that lived experience. Um, it's not a necessity, obviously. But um, yeah, a lot of us kind of gravitate towards this, this work, because, you know, we understand it. And we understand that a lot of people who contribute and a lot of people on this stream, I'm sure today, um, watching later, will have that lived experience as well. Um, it's what brings us all together. So yeah, and like you say, we'll touch on a lot of this later, but it's very important just to kind of have that conversation with anyone and everyone from, you know, from schools is very important from a young age. Um, and yeah, we'll talk a bit more about men specifically, because um, I know that's a, a very big area for you uh, a little bit later. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, so we'll just, we'll just jump straight into it. Um, I think it would be interesting to know how many times over the last year we've used the words isolation, pandemic, uh, COVID, lockdown, you know, all these horrible buzzwords that I can't wait to get rid of um, in my life. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's natural to start with COVID. Um, and we all have suffered in some way or another. How do you think that the pandemic really has brought mental health to the forefront? I think what, what I touched on earlier, Andre, I think there is so many people out in our society that have experienced isolation, mental health, with depression, with uh, loneliness, for the, probably for the very first time, because people have had busy lifestyles, people have been in normality, going to work nine to five, going on to see the kids, having that fast track normality, which is perceived, and then all of a sudden, it's taken away from them. So seeing their lad, seeing their mates at work, seeing their friends at work, whatever, doing the, going out drinking, socialising with friends, doing the things that you enjoy doing, taken away from you. So we've had to adapt, and I think for mental health, I think people are starting to really get it now, where they probably didn't before, because they never experienced it. And, you know, men in particular that have reached out to me personally in the last few months with the pandemic, have been really open about it, and really just not doubted themselves before, but just really, sort of really understanding now that this is real, that mental health is real, and why... You know, maybe I didn't need to, well, wasn't in a position to experience it before because everything was quite normal and um, comfortable. But we, in, obviously, in a, in a pandemic and, you know, hobbies and sort of things that people enjoy taking away from them for, without their control has led to people suffering. And I think a lot, lot more people are talking about it. And, and I think I have to put a positive spin on it because it's quite it's quite easy for us to really engage in the news and really take in the statistics and, and, you know, when are we coming out of lockdown and really absorb our energy into this. But I think for a lot of us, I think we need to do take the positives from this, from the pandemic and really have a, you know, be in a situation to really sort of evaluate our position, where we are in life, what can we improve on, have a bit of a reflection and, you know, make sure that we're in a, a really better place before we actually obtain normality. Yeah, I think what you say about life being, you know, normality being taken away is really interesting because I remember when it kind of happened, you know, and, and it was, life was normal and then suddenly it just wasn't, you know, overnight, you know, people started hearing about it and then suddenly it was, you know, you have to change the way that you live uh, and people, you know, if you're, if you're under the age of, I don't know, a, a high age, you know, you haven't been through anything like this before 
and it's it's just you don't know how to react so i think that's a really interesting point um that it was so sudden uh, and so just overnight um and i think to bring it to like to devon specifically because obviously we're devon mind um it it really hits people here quite hard i think because normality here is very steady uh, you know, typically the stereotypical view of like rural life is is relatively accurate. Um, you know, you just you get on with life and things are just quite normal and steady. You're not going on tubes everywhere. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, and, and we do have a lot of people who live in quite isolated areas. So it's it's made all the more you know difficult to actually interact with people when you're not allowed to go out. Mm. Yeah, that's an amazing point, a really a valid point, which I didn't even think about until you said. It's a very, very valid point. And we're in such a rural county, and there is the high life, if you like, the busyness, the, the where we are in this in this county is a little bit more laid back, a little bit more um, green-based, if you like. Yeah. And it's a different mentality, isn't it? And, you know, you go to London. I go to London quite a bit with watching football and things like that, and so that's for a day is quite hard sometimes with the hustle and bustle in the tubes. And so I think, put it in perspective, imagine if you have got that normality, and it depends, what, you know, we've all got a lifestyle, we've all got, um, you know, we've all got hobbies and so on, but take that away from you. It's, it's difficult. It really is. And, and, and what you made as a point is, is, is very valid, mate. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's affected everybody. I'm not going to play down any particular area, but I think, if you if you're working in the hustle and bustle you know i've got a lot of friends who live in london and it, it it's it's hard the hustle and bustle is hard and so to have that taken away briefly for a month or two was probably quite nice i, I would guess um but you know it's been a year now and that's too long way too long um but i think for us to have any any kind of normality interrupted is really tough um i've just seen the trauma artist who i know you've streamed with um said I don't want to go back to pre-COVID. And that's a really interesting perspective. I think, you know, we're talking about social isolation tonight and that started way before COVID. You know, people use social media all the time and social isolation is, is a very real issue. It will continue to be an issue. Um, and I think when you say to put a positive spin on COVID, um, you know, people now understand more than ever the value of connection, real life yeah. connection. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's going to be, you know, pre-COVID, maybe that was underestimated. Um, so hopefully, you know, that will be something that people carry forwards. And also, I think, you know, and I have to, to say this, and this is through experiences and, and feedback from people that I speak with. I think, obviously, having that sort of being adapting to COVID and adapting to isolation, adapting to being at home 24-7 has been really, really hard. And like what the trauma is just said, Pip and yourself, I think a lot of people are going to find it hard going back because people have enjoyed being at home, enjoying family life, enjoying that reflection, doing things like physical exercise. They probably wouldn't have had the chance to do so yeah. being at work, you know, and having, I don't know, just having that sort of quality time with the family and so on. So to go back into work and that taken away from you, it's a bit of a catch 22. I think if you put a spin on that, that's going to have a real effect. And you can imagine and just put this as a situation, Andre. You know when we all, we're all off for two weeks at Christmas and we go back with that cold turkey and that January blues? It's a bit yeah. like that, but 100 times worse in a way because you're going back after a year. Yeah, it's almost like for the first three months or so of COVID, it was like, this is new. But this is now the normal. And I know that people have said the new normal um, as like a post-COVID thing. But this is normal for a lot of people now. And there's going to be a lot of people who... Like you say, they're going to go back to work. And, you know, I know people who are going to be in this situation. They're going to go back to work and they're going to be told, well, you're going back to work and in the office five days a week and, you know, whatever, doing whatever you're doing. And, you know, people can see that they're, they're coping to some extent now with what they live in normal now. Yeah. Um, and that's just, it's just, I think when something goes on for that long, uh, it's just hard, very hard to adjust. And we're all just tired of all the adjustments and, trying to keep up with the rules you know i don't think anyone has been able to keep up with every single rule change um and yeah i mean i've got some i've got some numbers here written down just for some context but um the mental health foundation have been doing some surveys over the last year um of people in the uk to see kind of how they're dealing with covid and the numbers are quite scary in terms of how people are feeling in terms of hopelessness and isolation it's it's getting worse 
and um, you know, for things to just suddenly go back to normal, that will be an adjustment that I'm not sure how we're going to handle it. And obviously, we're taking this day by day and just seeing what happens. But yeah, it's going to be really tough. The job is not, you know, when COVID's over, the job is not over. There's going to be a lot of fallout from that. And obviously, we're anticipating as a mental health service provider that we've, we're going to have to help a lot of people. So we're trying to set ourselves up for that um, and just be there in the right places. So yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting. I think we all want to come out of the pandemic, but it's going to be interesting to see how we all adjust back to that. Yeah, and, and you know, on a personal note, with lockdown, like everybody else, we've had to adjust. We've had to have a different mindset and sort of vision on this. But as the months have gone on, and I've just embraced it, Andre, if I'm honest. Yeah. I've just been in a position to really concentrate more on my physical well-being and actually getting out and doing some exercise where I didn't have the opportunity to do so before. Maybe do some more cooking at home. I've been a domestic god, Andre, since I've... <laughs> Been in, uh, been in lockdown. I'm, I'm cleaning all the bloody really? time. So I would have done that before. Having a bit of pride at home, um, doing new hobbies, doing some artwork. I mean, I'm not very good at art, but doing some that stimulate the minds to to do something that relaxes you, where I probably would have took for granted before. So on a personal note, um, yes, it has been difficult, like for the rest of us. But you go, you you go mad if you read the stats and you engage the news and. Mm-hmm in a way feel sorry for yourself and I'm not and there's nothing wrong in that but you have to have a you have to embrace it as well because you will go do Ali you will go mad if you start to point negative reactions to every single situation so yeah on a personal note I think a lot of people can can agree that they find something that they've done differently or they've they've gone back to do doing something where they've neglected before if it's a hobby or physical exercise and yeah I just want to say what about you Andre what have you sort of Took or taken from the sort of pandemic which which has made you obviously happier yeah i think um i mean that's it's an interesting kind of perspective on it um i think back in march and april when people were first exposed to this and they were furloughed or whatever um you know we all did a lot of things i did a lot of gardening like you have um i did a lot of clean we'd, we'd actually only just moved into the house that we live in just before COVID. So there was a lot of cleaning and sorting out and stuff to do. So there was a lot of that. Um, but since then, it's kind of, it's, it's dropped off a bit. Um, I was actually in another job, uh, another charity job before uh, Devonmind. I joined Devonmind in August. So I was one of the very lucky people to get a job right in the middle of the pandemic. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, it's strange because it, I think it really depends on your personality. I think anyone, anyone who knows me uh, will know that I'm, very happy being at home uh, and just being in my own space. But even me, it's really started to affect, um, you know, not being able to see people uh, in person. Um, I live with my girlfriend and we get on really well. So we're quite lucky in that respect as well. Um, Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I've really picked up anything new, but I just focused on the things that, you know, before COVID, I was just working all the time and then just being knackered in the evening. Now, you know, I play guitar and I do a little bit of writing and things like that. So I've done a bit more of that. Um, and just taking the time to, you know, you can really separate things in your day and you can really make time for yourself now. So that's definitely a positive um, for me. I'm just going to scroll up a minute. We've had a couple of uh, comments. Yeah, so my friend Dave has said, uh, I really worry that people are going to put pressure on themselves to catch up uh, post-COVID. So I think when, when COVID started, people put a lot of pressure on themselves to be productive. That's definitely something that happened. People were like, right, I've got to do Zoom quizzes. I've got to make banana bread, you know, whatever it was at the beginning. Um, and I think a lot of people have realized that you don't have to put pressure on yourself. Like, take the time to look after yourself. This is the weirdest time we're ever going to live in, I'm sure. I hope. <laughs> I hope it's not going to get weirder than this. Um, yeah, and, and, and for sure, like, when, when we go back to normal, whatever that looks like, some people w- might think uh, there's a lot of pressure on them to to kind of catch up on lost time and finish things that they weren't able to finish or you know rebuild. Um, how do you think people? How do you think people can deal with that feeling? Yeah, I think people. I mean, it's human nature for a lot of people to put pressure on themselves, especially if they're at their comfort zone, uh, and all of us have in, because of the pandemic, because the uncertainty of what the environment is and. Yeah, you know everything was especially the first lockdown, Andre, where um, 
they were obviously trying to, to get the vaccine out and there was like ups and downs and there was figures and there's obviously with the, the high toll of uh, people losing their lives, which is unbelievable. And, you know, it was very, very easy to get sucked into that. Um, mm. But I think because, I'll say my, myself included, you get, you're at your comfort zone and you get a little bit scared because a lot of us don't like change as well because we're, if it's a bit an, uh, anxiety or because we like the norm, if you've seen the norm, our sort of routine. But sometimes it takes something like unusual like this or in another situation where, hang on a minute, um, we're in a change here, but naturally I'm going to have to adjust. So maybe doing, having a bit of a, a structure in life. So maybe having a things to do list, having a journal. So where you would have done that before, because you're always in a set routine, you're, you're sort of adjusting in a way because, um, you know, you're recognizing that you need, you do need to have a little bit of, um, you know, awareness and diagnosis of what's going on. And I think a lot of people do, well, don't like change and I'm one of them. And, and I think with the pandemic, especially, and it's, you know, it's been a difficult, difficult time. It's just, you know, we've just had to learn in ourselves. And I know that's not for everybody because there are so many, uh, many people that, uh, you know, can't be in that position to do it because they're struggling as it is with mental health or, and this has added to extra pressure and, and that is difficult. And it's really easy for me to say, um, but, you know, I've talked to a few people this year, especially where they feel this lockdown has been the toughest because Christmas, because it's winter, because you're not going out as much because of the cold weather. And I've just been just putting myself in that position and, and I've just really given an understanding, a bit of an awareness of what I would do. And, and, and don't blame yourself for anything. Don't put pressure on yourself to, to you know, to be well in a day or, you know, have that sort of feeling that everything's going to be better in two days, three days or whatever. Don't just go with the flow. Just don't rush yourself into situations and just have a, have a, a mindset to know this ain't forever, that we are going to be coming out of the pandemic. Yeah. The, the vaccines are rolling out. We are half the nation, I believe, and are going to be having it in the next month, maybe. So this ain't going to be forever and, and, and try and focus on the positivities that are uh, sort of coming your way because it is quite easy to, to really focus on the negatives, isn't it? Yeah, and I've, I've, you said about blame there. I've heard a lot of people say, I feel guilty for not doing this, X, Y, Z. Yeah. And it's like, this is out of all of our hands. Like, <laughs> it, it's very easy to say, don't feel guilty. Um, and, you know, I, I'm guilty of, as, of it as well. Guilty of being guilty, whatever that means. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's very easy to say, don't feel guilty. Um, but it's just a case, I guess, of putting it into, uh, framing it in a perspective that everyone's dealing with this and we're all kind of, making it up as we go along almost um but yeah i think it's it's important just to remind yourself of the things that you've done and picked up during the pandemic during lockdowns that have helped you is just to keep them as part of your arsenal of self-recovery uh self-help and then just kind of leaving things that are, are harmful behind um in the pandemic so anything that you feel has been you know isolation uh, not seeing friends and family these are all things that we've had to do uh, during the pandemic and it's just leaving them behind and moving on and keeping what's been good for you I think so yeah cool uh, it's very interesting so and just another just another one on that on top with obviously there's isolation people struggling not to see friends and family and so on and I think you touched on it earlier I think a massive one's relationships because obviously having that separation going to work having that that sort of time and space a lot of people have had testing times with having to adapt being together in a relationship, being home with the kids for 24-7, that's had a, a one way or another yes. sort of reflect on people, isn't it? Yeah, um, that you know, you hear about these horrible stories of domestic abuse rates going yeah. up and stuff, and it's it's really shocking, but it's it's not surprising because people are not used to spending all of their time with, with people like that. Um, like I said earlier, I'm really lucky in my situation. Hopefully you are too. Um, but yeah, it's... Hopefully it will balance out. Um, you've just got to find those those methods of kind of making it work somehow. But in terms of it being the winter and stuff like that and not being able to separate yourself and not being able to go outside, if, you know, if you finish work at five o'clock and it's pitch black already, um, you know, that's really hard to kind of make time for yourself. Um, so I think I, I, I think we're through the worst of that um, because it is, you know, clocks have just gone back or they're just going back at some point soon. Um, so we're just coming out of that kind of really dark 
cold, dreary period. So hopefully people have made it through the worst of it. But yeah, it's definitely still an issue that needs to be addressed so that there's no kind of long term impact of people spending all that time together. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, good point. Uh, I'm just having a look at the uh, top five concerns for adults that made their mental health worse during a pandemic. So this is something that Mind published way back in June last year, so quite early in the pandemic. Um, it's kind of the stuff you'd expect, but uh, number one is being a, unable to see family, friends or partners that you don't live with. So obviously the isolation from people not seeing people that you don't live with. Uh, feeling anxious about people getting the virus. Um, just a terrible thing, like you say, so many tragic deaths and so many things that could have been different, maybe. Um, yeah, it's, 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 I don't really know how to go on on that. It's just so tough. Um, yeah. And not being able to go outside and being bored and restless is another massive reason. Um, it's really, it's been really hard. A lot of, you know, a lot of charities and a lot of organizations have tried really hard to give people things to do and how to be engaged at home but when like you say when you've got children who have got to be home and you've got people working at home you know not everybody's lucky enough to have a big house that they can all spread out in and mm -hmm. you know good internet connection it can be really frustrating so yeah. it's um there's a lot of pressure out there and uh, i just hope that now being you know almost april 2021 we are past the worst of it um just we just got hope haven't we basically Absolutely. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you made a good point. Yeah. Um, th there are so many people out there that haven't got a garden. They haven't got access to Greenland close to where they are. Or, yeah. And it's very, very difficult. And like you say, with having to adapt and obviously ha home life, our environment, our, our homes are our castles and that's where our safest place is and how it should be. And yeah, it's, it's very difficult for a lot of people that, that haven't got that facility of, let's say, accessible to, to fields, to scenery, to, let's say, gardens and stuff as well. So it's, very, very, yeah. it's a very good point. And that work-life balance as well, just having, you know, work and home life is in the same building. That's really hard, I think. So, you know, I know a lot of people struggle with that balance. So it's something, it's something that we still need to address and tackle. Um, but let's move on because we talked about COVID for a long time. Um, let's talk about men's mental health because I know that's uh, a speciality of yours. Uh, you work with a lot of men in Plymouth and Devon. Um, so do you think, I mean, we, I say we move on from the pandemic, we'll talk a bit more about it now, but um, mm. how do you think specifically men have been impacted by the pandemic and lockdowns? And what kind of, what are the biggest issues you think that men are facing now in terms of their mental health? Yeah, I think firstly, you know, having feedback from men that I've spoken with and being a man myself that have experienced struggles this year and last year, um, I think, you know, men especially having that pressure of being the, 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 the perfect dad at home to their kids, to have that, to being the strongest one in the family, to having that, you know, um, the man look, if you like. And it's a lot of pressure being at home. There's a lot of pressure being at home with your partner, with the kids, not seeing your mates playing football, because sometimes that can be a massive release for men having sport, having it, and for women as well, but having that exercise to go and play football, even if it's to go down the the pub and see you know the, you know, the mates because sometimes us guys we don't we're not as good as communicating we are with women as women we know that and sometimes our release is to have a pint down the pub if it is to play football if it is to watch a live band and sometimes the environment's key you know, for, for men to sort of have that comfortable conversation and, and rely on it so to have that taken away and men find it difficult anyway to, to talk more than women is that's even harder and obviously accessing services like Minds, like the Samaritans, Young Minds, uh, Papyrus, all these amazing charities. Men are less, they're less reluctant because they feel they don't want to be the weak, the weak person or be, be you know, seen as the weak and because of the stigma, because, uh, because of the, um, you know, what's gone on in childhood, the lack of school education with mental health. It all stems from childhood you know, from what I've experienced, that there was no education at school for mental health, where there is sex education. So family, peers, friends, you know, all these things that you, you're brought up in life with, not, not knowing how to deal with emotions and not having a lack of mental health. When you're at home and you're at home 24-7 and you are relying on seeing your mates, you are relying on having that release if it's in sport and being at home, perceiving to be, a, you know, normal and strong and happy, 
is extremely, extremely difficult. And that is the feedback that I get of a lot of guys is that I don't want to be seen weak at home because, yeah. um, you know, the, the tools have, have been taken away from me, if you like, if it's having banter at work or, let's say, going down for a curry with the lads or whatever it is. Sometimes that's the way men can reach out. And sometimes men feel uncomfortable talking to their partners um, because of the stigma, because they don't want to be seen as the weaker one. And I get a lot of that, Andre, where men are struggling to, to reach out to their close ones. Yeah, I think those are the kind of classic reasons that men often struggle is because of the stigma. They feel that they can't speak up. And I think that's just been amplified by the pandemic, hasn't it? And it's brought into sharp focus. It's right in front of them now. Um, and like you say, with their partners and children around, it's it's like you need to speak about it but where where can you direct that energy and you don't want to you know you don't want to be a burden you don't want to appear weak like you say um and yeah it's it's really tough so um yeah it's interesting it's very interesting but what i but what I, you know i asked i mean only uh, somebody i spoke to last week that he made that phone call to the samaritans i think he saw something online about you know pandemic related and he, he actually made that call and he actually got in touch with the Samaritans. He was on the phone for around about two hours, and he, he actually sent me a message afterwards, um, or a day afterwards, just to say, look, I don't know why I did this earlier. It's only what's perceived as stigma. And for me, listening to that, it's for millions and millions of men, because you, once you take that step, which is a sign of strength, anyhow, once you obtain that sort of recognition to know that you need help, to speak to somebody professional or, or somebody just to have a, an understanding or just listening, having that sort of um, first step, if you like, is a massive strength. And once people, men especially, that are reaching out and having that conversation, they don't really look back after that. And he was he just felt like a huge weight was off his shoulders because the, the barrier was just a stigma, you know, and what he was really brought up with, that there was a lack of understanding, there was a lack of how to deal with emotions and who to speak to. And once he did have that conversation with the Samaritans, he was able then to really talk to his wife, to, to, to have phone calls and Zooms with his, with his mates. And it was opening a can of worms, but it does take that step, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think, I, I imagine you speak to a lot of men and you say the same thing over and over again. Don't be afraid to speak up. Um, yeah. But it can't be said enough. Uh, there are so many people out there who will listen to you. Um, you know, right away, if, if you don't know where to go, just send a message to us. Send a message to Paul. Just say, this is how I'm feeling. Uh, I don't know what to do. I don't know who to talk to. You know, we know of a lot of people who can help with specific problems or, you know, just general kind of depression, anxiety, you know, the, the common the common, uh, the common offenders. Um, but, yeah, it's just, like you say, taking that first step is so hard and it's so it, it's such a sign of strength, like you say. Um, that, yeah, it, we can't really say it enough. Do just reach mm. out. If you feel like you've got something in your brain that you want to get out uh, and you don't know where to put it, just put it somewhere. Put it to, to Devon Mind, to National Mind, to Paul, to the Samaritans. You know, they're open 24-7. Text, shout to, I think it's 85258, isn't it? Uh, text, shout to them. And, that you know, you don't even have to talk to someone. You can just text someone. And it's completely anonymous. And just take that first step. And the rest will follow, I think, is the message. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. And, and also, it's having, a, like for, for myself, if it was my partner struggling with mental health or if she wasn't herself or our friends around us, also it's about having an awareness of the signs yeah. to see as well and having that sort of awareness. So if you have a friend or your loved one that's not acting themselves, that they're not maybe cleaning themselves and they're, they're, they're sort of um, neglecting themselves with their health, uh, they're not attending social meets um, and just not really being themselves, not their joking way, they're quiet. They're, and, and having an awareness really of, of just noticing the signs. And on that Ronan Kemp documentary last night, which was, which was absolutely powerful, he made a really good point, actually, about asking them if they're OK twice. Yeah. So asking your mate, look, are you OK, mate? And, he was, and, and the reply would be, yeah, I'm all right. And then you say, are you really OK? That is a powerful, powerful message because that means you really are caring and you really are wanting to help and listen. And that person, it feels this, feels this empathy, feels this power of a message that 
I'm going, yeah, I'm not actually okay. I, I, I would like to talk and have a coffee. Or, and it's such a massive, massive, um, you know, conversation, isn't it? Yeah, I think exactly you're right. Um, I've heard the talk, the ask twice thing a few times, and it's it's so important because, you know, everybody says, are you okay once? You know, you go down the shop and you say, you're right, mate. And they go, you're right. You know, and especially with, with men, stereotypically, you know, we, we all kind of greet each other with, with you're right. Um, and, you know, it, it can be brushed off quite quickly. But if you, you know, you reinforce that, I'm sure that the rate of people who will speak back to you then on the second time is astronomical. You know, to open that door is to just go, you know, you're completely safe now. You can tell me whatever you're feeling and I will help you uh, in whatever way I can point, point you in the right direction because, you know, we're not all trained to, to counsel people or uh, provide the help, but obviously pointing somebody in the right direction can be a massive burden off their shoulders. Um, so yeah, that's really important. I haven't seen that documentary yet. I didn't catch it last night, but I will have to check that out because it sounds very, very interesting. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was a, it was a powerful documentary and mm. I won't, I'm not, I won't say too much, but yeah, let me know what your thoughts are on a DM. Um, and the, let's say the, the message is really um, needed, as we know that, you know, suicide is the biggest killer of men under the age of 49 in the UK. And it's rising. It's, it's rising because of the pandemic, because of the, the situation not being at its greatest with the environment. It, it, there's so many factors. And, you know, like I, like I say to people, I'm very, very focal to a lot of people that, that get in touch if they're speaking on behalf of their partners if they feel uncomfortable to do so, is if you are listening to somebody and they are um, opening up for the first time and they're feeling scared and agitated, if you're that person on the re receiving this communication, just give that person space and time without any judgment and, and empathy, give them the empathy to allow and give people or that person time in, you know, to open up when they need to because sometimes we can pressure people to talk, sometimes... We yeah. can give body language and the wrong vibe. Sometimes we don't know how to deal with it ourselves. But it, if we can have that empathy, if we can have that patience, no, a non-judgmental sort of reaction, that will help that person so, so much. And the amount of relationships, the amount of people that we work with that don't really have that sort of awareness and education is, is lost a bit in society because people want to reach out. People want that cry for help. But if that reaction from that other person is not what they need to hear and see, yeah. then they're going to bottle things up even more. And this is why I'm always vocal that mental health uh, workshops, training, uh, breakaway um, rooms and, and whatever is so needed in schools. It's paramount as well as employment, you know, employers as well as colleges, because, you know, it's, if sex education is mandatory, which it is mental health awareness it's more important and it needs to be once a day, once an hour. If somebody's, I went to a school in Paynton. I did a talk in Paynton, Andre, and I, sorry if I'm talking too much, but I'm passionate about what I'm talking about. I, um, I, did a, I did a talk in Paynton two years ago with, with Males Aloud and the, the teacher was showing me around the, the facility about what they do with uh, kids that might be struggling. They have a breakaway room um, where if kids are, are struggling in class, if they're not concentrating, if their environment's not great, if they're not feeling comfortable or things are going on at home, the kids have, have an option. They have a voice, but they can go into this room and they can actually have just a 10-minute, 20-minute breakaway where they're in this room where they feel safe. They feel that they don't have to feel pressure to do work, coursework or whatever, and, and feel comfortable to have a conversation with a trained mental health first aider a TA training, you know, teacher assistant, where they are, they have a voice and they listen and they, there's no judgment. And that's so important And because mental health starts at an, an early age. And this is where we need education and awareness in schools, first and foremost. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. I think having the breakaway room um, and having people trained, I mean, the mental health first aid course, I've done uh, the mental health first aid England course. Um, and you've, I know you've done some advanced training as well. Um, it, you know, there are some very simple steps that can be implemented quite quickly in a lot of areas of society that can, you know, arm people with that, that kind of thing. Because like you say, for people to take that first step and open up, um, it needs to be greeted in the correct way. And it needs to be because it, it can end up being one step forward and two steps back because yeah. they won't then open up again for double the time kind of thing. They'll feel scared because of the reaction. So I think 
it's still, you know, the conversation has been happening for so long and we're still so ill-prepared for, for how to actually deal with those challenges. So I think you're exactly right. Um, I used to work at a children's charity, actually, and they had a very similar thing. So they would work with um, children from, like, difficult backgrounds and vulnerable backgrounds and things like young carers, things like that. Um, and they would have a room that was designated. And it was almost one of the first things that they introduced. And they said, look, if at any point during your week with us, you feel overwhelmed or upset or anything, you go into this room free of judgment and someone will, you know, talk to you in your own time and listen to you, basically. Um, and I think that safe space, you know, is so important for so many things and for young children to know that they can speak and they can be listened to. Um, yeah. You know, it, <laughs> a lot of people just don't have the time to listen these days and that needs to be front and centre, uh, yeah, day one of school, like you say, so... And also, you know, having a an education and awareness in, in schools to for kids to know themselves how to deal with emotions, to have an awareness and, you know, to, to know that they can feel comfortable with no judgment in expressing their feelings if it's uh, in an open classroom or with a teacher or even at home with their, with their family because a lot of kids don't like talking to their family because of shame because they don't know what the reaction would be and, you know, we need to have tools in the, in, in the box when it comes to um having you know self-care self-love having a diagnosis of ourselves with uh you know having to deal with emotions and and sometimes and well it does happen men women are in their 40s 30s 50s whatever sometimes struggle with their emotions because they've never really been taught it yeah exactly and it's always been a stigma it's always been something you don't share it's always been yeah. something that should be private and you should deal with yourself and that's just completely wrong essentially um just a couple of things from uh carly p uh she said uh, follow dr alex george he's doing great work in school so he is the yeah. um i don't know what his official title is but he's a mental health um ambassador who's recently yeah. been hired by the government as an he? so um yeah we're we're kind of waiting with bated breath to see how what comes of that that's a, a really good move by the government um and also she said check out place to be so yeah if you have uh, children or young people in your life who you think might be struggling with mental health or you just want to help them learn about it, um, Place to Be are a fantastic charity. Uh, we've shared some of their things in the past for Children's Mental Health Week and things like that, which was quite recently. Um, yeah, Place to Be. Uh, check them out if yeah. that's something that you want to learn about. Uh, are they yeah, on Instagram? Yeah, they're on Instagram. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So Thank we'll you. probably share some links after this. Oh, somebody, hello, Stace. She works for Place to Be. Yeah, you guys do fantastic work. So <laughs> thank you for that. Keep it up. Um, yeah, and just one more point I wanted to make on um, on men's mental health specifically. I think you mentioned something similar to it. Um, yeah, everybody, I think it's common knowledge by now that, uh, you know, suicide is a massive, massive problem for men specifically. Um, the numbers are kind of skewed uh, that women are known to women are recorded as suffering more with mental health issues generally um but the rates of suicide in men is almost three times or over three times as much as women so the importance of having that conversation with the men in your life is is absolutely critical because by the time they open up it could be too late uh more so than with women women are more likely to speak to you not to say you shouldn't reach out to the women in your life because of course you should um, but yeah, with men, if you notice any signs, make sure that you do act on them as soon as possible. Um, and like you say, if they're acting slightly different and not doing the things that you'd expect them to do, then that's usually uh, a good sign that you should kind of jump in and see if they need any assistance. I think with me um, and with other people in my life, it started with losing interest in things that you always had an interest in. So uh, I went off football, went off music um went off video games um and that was kind of the, the the first sign that i was falling into an area that from which i needed a hand to get out basically so yeah just just look out for those signs um and just reach out and just be be somebody who can listen basically yeah yeah absolutely yeah. and they say it's, it's paramount that we recognize the signs with our let's say brothers our fathers or the men at work um sport events every, you know every angle and, and if they're not acting themselves, if they're not turning up to social events, if they're not turning up to the quiz night, if they're, they're not participating in anything or, you know, if they're not feeling motivated to do the cleaning even, or they're not even um, acting themselves and not, you know, they're not in their jokey way, just tackle that conversation. Just, just, just 
don't be afraid to to ask, are you really okay? And say that twice, like we covered earlier, because we know the signs of behaviours in our friends and family around us. And sometimes yeah. we don't have an awareness. Sometimes we take it for granted that maybe they may be just having a, an off day. They may be just be, might be the weather that might be causing them to be a little bit down, but never really assume because you don't really know what's going on with that person. And, you know, if you don't say nothing at all, then, you know, you just, it could be too late. Yeah. And if you ask the question too many times, it doesn't matter. You can't ask it too many times. If you say, exactly. you know, if you, if you think I'm having an off day and you say, are you okay? No harm done. They might just be like, oh yeah, it's just miserable weather, isn't it? Like, Fine, yeah. ask him again. Make sure you ask twice. Um, yeah, but yeah, and then and then just take it from there. Basically, um, I'm conscious of time. We've gone quite a long time on this. Um, it's almost eight o'clock already. Um, wow. I'll I'll invite people to leave any questions if they want to ask myself or Paul anything about what we are working on at the moment. But other than that, I think um, it's important to signpost to a few of the key services. Um, so obviously, the first most important is um, is the Samaritans. They are available 24-7 for free from any phone. Um, it's 116-123. You'll find that number. Just type in Samaritans or look on our website anywhere. Uh, 116-123. If you ever feel like you're approaching a mental health crisis or you're not sure where to turn, the Samaritans will deal with it in the best way that you can imagine. They will deal with any issue that you throw at them. Um, and they are fantastic. So please remember that one. Um, I mentioned shout earlier if you don't want to talk on the phone. And I know that a lot of people, especially young people, don't want to talk on the phone. I hate talking on the phone. Um, you can text SHOUT to 85258, and that's free as well, and that is also 24-7. They have amazing volunteers uh, across the UK, so that's another one that I would recommend. There's also the, uh, specifically for Devon, there is the Devon Partnership Trust. They operate a, uh, so it's an NHS service. They operate a 24-7 helpline as well. Um, what I would say is go on to uh, the Devon Mind website, check out our useful contacts page. You should find it in the menu. Um, and that's got all kinds of contacts for specific issues. If you're a, a child or young person, uh, if you specifically want to talk about male mental health, uh, you know, you can call CALM. Um, there's prevention of young suicide. There's so many contacts on there. And we've just actually put a brand new tool on our website, which is really handy to uh, to click through and say, this is how I'm feeling. And we give you some ideas of who you can talk to. So, yeah, just a few kind of key things there to uh to flag up anything you want to add to that Paul? yeah no i think you've covered um every amazing charity going out there that are doing um uh, amazing things even through the pandemic so i say guys don't be afraid if you are watching uh, and you watch later on in the week month year if you are watching this and you are struggling or if you know somebody that is struggling don't be afraid to signpost that person you know with the services don't be afraid to encourage uh your loved one your friends uh, to reach out to these services because what we touched on earlier it's a sign of strength to to recognize something might not be quite right and you know we all perceive what the reaction could be so we could make that phone call we might not expect it to be great but in, in hindsight people are there to help people are there to listen with no judgment so don't feel afraid if you are in that position that you are reluctant to make that phone call or text it will be the best decision you'll ever make because you won't look back you will you will get help you will get through it it's it's not going to be an overnight fit, but as long as you've got that patience and understanding and awareness with yourself, then you know you will get there. And um, like I say, if you if you ever want to message me, that's fine. That's that, my DMs are always open with no judgment. If I haven't got the answer and I don't know how to to really give you advice, I will go away and find the information. And I'll you know it might take me a day or so, but I will you know I will get back to you if I don't have the answer because you know for me it wouldn't be any. Um, use for you if I told you the wrong information it wouldn't be fair so that that is exactly what I do and I always do that with people that I, I talk, do one-to-ones with on on Instagram for sure and you know we you know we're, we're there for each other yeah exactly and it's a kind of uh it's a self it's like a cycle isn't it it's a good cycle if you you make that call uh and you start to you know have that discussion with somebody um, you'll then find yourself helping somebody else just naturally. And it's a great kind of experience that it, it just, it, it feeds itself and it's a cycle. So I think with, with all of us talking about it and all of us listening to one another, it will, you know, we will fix this pandemic, a different pandemic. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Absolutely. I, know, I know just one more thing. I know you said you obviously you work for mine and, and you have lived experiences like me. And I think it's uh, amazing that, 
we can have a conversation with people about our experiences that can get it, that can have that sort of relatable conversation because, you know, people are scared to go and see their GP because they may not have the experiences and that's fine. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's okay. And that's people's perception. That's, and, and they are there to help. They are there to give you medication, which again is no shaming. But sometimes having a conversation with somebody with lived experiences can also be an amazing, powerful thing. And people can give you a lot more sort of empathy and understanding as well. And, you know, and I get that talking to people, you know, with Instagram and I get it straight away if there's something not right or because of what they're saying and, and it's the way that they're feeling and whatever. And it, it's just an amazing thing, mate, isn't it? Yeah. And I think, like I said earlier, if people weren't on earlier, um, most of the people who work in these kind of roles or volunteer for services like the Samaritans and Shout, they do have that lived experience. So you're talking, you're, you're preaching to the choir, essentially. You're talking to somebody who understands it and doesn't want the stigma to exist. So yeah, like you say, it can be hard to talk to like, I found it difficult to talk to parents in the past or like, you know, older people in your family. Um, and yeah, GPs as well are sometimes difficult because they're not specialized in those kind of things. But there yeah. are hundreds, hundreds of people out there who are waiting to hear from you. So, yeah, just make that call. And um, as Paul said, we're obviously our DMs are always open. Um, we're, you know, that's what we do. We talk to people in Devon. We cover all of Devon now. So please get in touch with Devon Mind if there's anything you need. If you, you know, we try to be in every position that somebody might touch base with us. So if you're on Instagram, Facebook, any socials, uh, you know, if you want to send an email, you want to call, you know, we're available as, in as many places as we can be. So we're just trying to make sure that you know that we're here to listen to you, essentially. Um, and we're, we're a frontline service that will point you in the right direction if we don't have a service that's applicable to you. Um, Jamie Lee earlier said we should get a petition started to get mental health awareness in schools, as like you say, it's massively important. I think now's the time to do that. Uh, with Alex George in his position now, let's let's start that movement. Let's talk about it. Um, maybe that's something that I'll start from Devon Mind, and we'll uh, we'll get it going. Definitely. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's something I did with Mel's Alive, and I'm going to be continue doing talks uh, when all this is over to be linked in with schools to to come in and have a conversation with students from primary to secondary and even university. Because I always remember when I was in school, and I remember the firemen coming in doing a demonstration on fire extinguishers or talking yeah. about their lived experiences and I remember being locked into these conversations and and sort of getting it so I know for a fact and I think everybody does is that having people with lived experience especially coming into schools with prevention colleges universities is absolutely paramount because kids will get it they're, 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 they're sort of brains are like sponges and yeah. the more we can have prevention the more we can have an education and awareness and have role models in in kids life that you know, we've been in that position. We've been at school when we've struggled. Everything will be okay. You know, you will get the help if you have an education and awareness and understanding. Yeah, like you say, it starts from a young age and it's it's something, the problem's not going to go away. It's still going to be there when these people are adults. So yeah. why not tackle it at the stage where you know it's going to be most effective? Um, you know, they say teach a language to a child under five, they'll remember it forever. Um, you know, teach children from that age about mental health and they'll understand it as well. So, um, yeah, it's definitely a movement that, you know, we're keen to, to back. Um, people like Young Minds and Young Devon are doing fantastic work in that arena. So um, I'd recommend following those guys as well. Uh, just scrolling through here. Uh, Destroyed says he still doesn't think his DM went through. I know he was trying to get a hold of you. Um, so Oh, yeah. I, I literally had my... DMs uh, on private because I was getting loads of messages and I had to have some self care. But I've actually made it public in the last couple of days, so anybody can DM me now. Cool. Hopefully, you'll be able to get through to you. Uh, staffing at train, yeah. So on, on the staff train, on the training as well in schools, um, we have we have some inquiries from local schools who talk to us about wanting mental health training, um, and you know we provide a very good service on that. That's actually one of our biggest strengths. So. I would say if anybody know if anyone works at schools um, or knows anyone who does and they could benefit from mental health first aid training and some basics on on mental health awareness, um, get in touch with us. Just drop us a line uh, on any platform, and I'll point you towards our training manager, Richard. He's fantastic. He's been doing it for twenty, thirty odd years, um, and yeah, they can arm you with the tools to kind of teach the, the students about that stuff. So yeah, make sure uh, to do that. Do 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 do. Okay. 
Yeah, so we haven't got any other questions. Um, and I'm conscious that it's an hour and I don't want to lose the video. Because um, I know you said that it can disappear if it goes over an hour. So uh, if, if no one else has got any questions, um, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, okay. Yeah, we can definitely do another one of these because I think we've still got a lot of, a lot of ground to cover. Um, yeah. yeah, it's been fantastic, Paul. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, if you're watching this later on demand, um, on demand, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're not Channel 4 or anything, but you know, um, yeah, just send us a message, leave a comment on anything that you uh, want to know, um, you want signposting to. One of us will help you. Obviously, Devonmind is operational office hours, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. So just drop us a line. Uh, we will yeah, be happy to help. So, yeah, thank you very much. I think that's it.